All right, so uh, before, for those of you who do not know me, um, I think I've talked to all of you, or most of you today. Uh, my name is Brenton Lengel. Uh, I am a graduate of Russell County High School, um, and uh, I have been working for the last uh, 10 years as a playwright in New York City, beating my head against the wall, um, and recently I have transitioned into comics, um, which I'm really excited about because it's much easier to get someone to buy your comic than come to your play. <laughs> um, yeah, but overall, like at, at this point, um, you know, I majored in theater. Uh, I'm trained as an actor, uh, playwright, uh, screenwriter, and comic author. And what I wanted to talk about today is to talk about adapting, because all of my work has just about everything you find is like. If I, if I write a play that I really like, I adapt it into a screenplay because there's no money in theater, like, mm -hmm. at all. Like, I know everybody would be like, no, no, I'm sure I'll find money. No, no. none. <laughs> Even at, like, the highest level, they got to work for Hollywood just to get health insurance. Um, all right, so then, uh, also, coming to comics, this has been a big thing for me uh, because I, like, two of my biggest creative influences were Calvin and Hobbes, uh, Bill Larson, Calvin Hobbes, I think that was the mm -hmm. first thing that I was nuts about. And then uh, I followed that up with, um, uh, with Elf Quest by Wendy and Richard Penny. And I love that we're having this in a library because that's where I found the original um, Elf Quest uh, you know, um, graphic novels and, and read them. I used to, I made a tape of myself practicing my violin for strings in middle school uh, that I played and just read ElfQuest comics. <laughs> but uh, just so you guys know, to get you a little more familiarized with my work, uh, I've got trailers for the two series, uh, both of which I have here. So let's get this first one going. Um, they're pretty short, just, but yeah. Here. No, you don't need to listen to that guy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're creating a window award nominee. Okay, Brett. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing a very good job. Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is the, that was the first one. That's Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. Uh, and we're going to talk about that series first, because this is like the biggest one that I've done adaptations uh, with. Uh, and I'll try this second one uh, beforehand, but I'll leave this up, because I, 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 with that fresh in your mind, so, when you're, a lot of people, when they start out, uh, a, a lot of writers and actors and stuff, like, really start out in the theater. And the reason why they start out in the theater is schools have theater programs. And colleges, just about every college will have a theater major. Most of them will not have a film major. Uh, and the ones that do, they're good sometimes and, and not so good. Uh, I went to UK's theater program. Uh, I learned a lot, mostly by accident. Um, but uh, one of the things that was really useful is, is that I trained as an actor. So I thought I was going to be an actor for a while until I realized I really don't like doing, realizing other people's vision. Because I always was sitting there thinking like, I could do this better. <laughs> so then eventually I just started uh, writing my own plays. Um, so the thing when you're writing for the when you're writing for the stage, or you're writing for the screen, or you're writing for comics, these are all related writing skills, but they are very very different because each medium has things that it does well uh, and things that uh, it could more or less uh, improve upon. So 
playwrights, for instance, right now are getting uh, hired by uh, big movie producers, which thankfully, yeah, that's important because like I said, you cannot make a living as a playwright. Just, mm -hmm. just won't happen. Um, but the reason they're doing that oftentimes is the playwrights are actually better trained than people that went through film programs a lot of the time. Uh, we're especially good at dialogue mm -hmm. and we learn to write for, we learn to write and focus on our characters and we learn to write for actors. Um, the uh, Snow White Zombie, uh, that came out of a 10 minute, uh, should, should just go with the water, right? Not the powder. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so um, that came out of a 10 minute play that I wrote for a 24 hour play competition in New York. I was new there. The way this worked was they had a bunch of writers submit. We had to write a 10 page script uh, and then send it to them overnight and then they would decide uh, which scripts they were going to use and then perform them, uh, you know, uh, within uh, 24 hours, or I'm sorry, within 48 hours. So. Um, it wound up, uh, I had applied for a lot of things, I was used to never getting anything, uh, and I got the email, and I started to read it, and I was already like, oh, how dare they, this is a great, oh, oh, wait, oh, no, they want me to go. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, I, the, it wound up then going on to a production in, at the Esther Genius Festival, um, uh, of uh, which is a celebration of women's voices. I guess someone saw me from behind and assumed I was the chick. <laughs> um, but no, it, it won Audience's Choice Award there, and th there were a lot of really great things about that production that kind of helped me move further in my career. Um, the guy that you saw in there, the Prince Charming, uh, copying a, a, a sleeping kiss, um, that is actually he's patterned directly off one of the actors who played Prince Charming, but a guy by the name of Adam Lafachi, phenomenal actor. Um, but because I had the, the background writing as a actor, I knew how to write for actors and to figure out what would get them really uh, interested in doing it. Because, you know, to tell you the truth, like, if you get actors on board, especially early on, it is so much easier to get them to work uh, for an honorarium. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's something fun that they want to do that's different. Um, also did a lot of stage combat in that one, and that actually, interestingly enough, ties directly into Mr. Bertram's martial arts class at Russell County High School. Um, I loved that class. It was my favorite thing about, uh, and Bert, Mr. Bertram taught us Jujuende, which was a way to do, it was basically stage combat, but good stage combat, because most stage combat is awful. <laughs> um, but ours was more about practicing technique, so we could make things look really good. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows Josh Connor, he's Tara Connor's brother. Uh, he actually choreographed the fights with me, he was living with me in New York, and uh, he was playing the big bad wolf. And literally, like, when, especially because it was a, a theater in a very small space, like, the big bad wolf comes running at Rapunzel and she throws him over her shoulder. And like, the second he hits the ground, I, I just hear the audience gasp, because they'd never seen anything like that on that intimate of a stage. Also, maybe they were worried about them getting thrown into a very, very small, intimate space. Um, but anyway, uh, so if you're working as a playwright, you, the, the key thing that you're doing to bring out the most is that, uh, the most of, out of your play, is uh, one, you are focusing on your characters. Everything in, in theater is character driven. And that is because there's not a lot of spectacle you can do unless you, you know, you're Julie Taymor and you have millions of dollars for uh, Broadway. Um, so you're usually everything you're doing is kind of cobbled together with spit and duct tape and you have to, through the words um, and the dialogue, craft this story. Usually it takes place in one or two locations. I was terrible about that, by the way. My plays always moved. I never just put them in like one room. <laughs> um, so uh, the muscles that you use essentially as a playwright to tell a successful story uh, are actor, char actor focused, character focused, and dialogue focused. And if you can write those three things, you can then just hand your script over to a director, if it's a good director with a good cast, they're going to be able to bring their own creativity to it and you'll have an amazing production that you can then take credit for. <laughs> um, so then I went from, I had, I'd had it in the back of my head, I expanded that to a two hour play in the Fringe Festival. 
And the, the whole time I had it in the back of my head that uh, I, would want, I wanted to do a comic because comics were my first inspiration. Um, however, I had no idea how to do a comic, who to talk to, how to make any of this happen. So um, I had had an agent come by and not hire, like not work with me, who basically said, hey, you know, this, she really liked some of the dialogue and the comedy that I was doing. She's like, oh, you should, you know, write screenplays. I was like, that's great, I should. How do I do that? <laughs> so then I wound up uh, with a place called Jacob Kruger uh, Studios, uh, which is online as well. Um, they're a phenomenal school, very expensive, but um, you get taught by, like, people that actually do it. A lot of the times, like, when you're learning from academics, even with theater, a lot of them are not actually producing plays. They are learning about and they're producing within their programs, but they're not doing the kind of work, you know, in the outside world that they need to be doing. Um, so, as far as um, when you move on from playwriting to screenwriting, there's huge differences. Um, in playwriting, they tell you, you know, be minimal on your stage directions, let the director do all that stuff, but that does not work in a film script, and it definitely does not work in a movie, unless you have some genius director. Um, and because movies are more of a business, it's less likely that you'll have someone who has the tools to bring the, uh, the movie to life, uh, just based upon the dialogue and the characters. So when you are writing then for the screen, uh, when you're then writing a screenplay, um, what's happening is, is that you are transliterating that screenplay, like, like you're adapting it um, from comics, or I'm sorry, from theater, which is an audio, auditory medium, to film. And film is very much a visual medium. So when you're writing a screenplay, you know, you need to be working to tell as much of the story as possible just with the images. Because that's quicker, that's easier, and then and also like directors especially. Um, so just like you want people to come in and add their creativity to yours in the theater, um, directors want to direct a film that they have an effect on. And so you kind of have to play this game uh, where you are writing your script in such a way that, um, yeah, where you are writing your script in such a way uh, that the director, you're, you're doing inception. You're trying to convince the director that your awesome ideas about it are actually his by the way that you write, or hers. <laughs> um, so, you know, going from Snow White Zombie Apocalypse on stage, where I'm relying on fun stage combat, but, which is pretty much not in the script, uh, and dialogue and jokes, going from that to a visual um, film medium, I, you know, I'm instantly, instead of typing out, like, they fight, uh, <laughs> thank you, George Lucas, um, <laughs> I am literally going in there and beat for beat writing out the fight. And this was really important, and this is why it was really important that I have a martial arts background. Because when I'm writing for a fight, I know how these things actually go. Um, and so, it, you know, it, 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 you're able to stand out among other screenwriters if you're able to do something like that. But what you have to understand with screenwriting also is, is that one, the format is really exact. Um, they are looking for any excuse whatsoever to throw your script in the garbage when, when you submit to a, a film company. Because the person who reads your script first in a film company is usually a bored, annoyed intern that does not want to be reading scripts. They want to be making their movies. So, you know, when they, when they get a good script, they really, really will enjoy it. But even then, it gets kicked up the line a little bit. So your very first reader, the first line of uh, opposition that you have to get through is you've got to make that guy love your script and make him think and make him show it to his bosses. Now there's a couple of ways to do that. One, never go over like 120 pages. In fact, the shorter you can get, you know, down to like 90, 90 to 120 is kind of the the sweet spot. Um, and like, you have to keep things in mind, like for instance, this is a rule I learned from uh, George Strayton, who uh, wrote for Xena and Hercules, uh, and works with J.J. Abrams. Never have like a line, any more than four lines of text 
in your in your description. If you go more than four lines, you've got to do a, a space. And the reason again is you got a board intern, you got to get past. But even if you get past him, then you've got to get past a an executive. And of course, the executives are not creative people. Uh, they usually like. Did anybody see um, uh, Thirty? Uh, yeah, Thirty Rock. Yes. Have you seen that? Okay. So you know how in 30 Rock at the beginning, uh, Jack Donaghy gets put in charge of the TV studio mm -hmm. because he was really good at selling an oven that had three kinds of heat. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably one of the most incredibly accurate things about the industry. Yeah. Um, you know, these are, you know, if the parent company owns Pepsi, someone's really good at selling Pepsi, okay, now you're in charge of film. <laughs> um, so then you've got to get past that guy. Now that guy has probably gone and he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't want anyone to know he doesn't know what he's doing. So he goes and he buys a book on screenwriting, probably Save the Cat, which is a good book. Uh, but the thing is, is that what he's trying to do usually, or, or she, <laughs> uh, is um, look for a formula. Um, in Hollywood, there are, there's a structure to every Hollywood film. Um, I compare it to like haiku, like you never see a haiku that's like not five, seven, five. Mm -hmm. um, now, this has been broken down into a lot of different overall like things to do with the story. You know, you've got the inciting incident 10 minutes in where, you know, the, the... so to do this very quickly, <laughs> character starts from a place where, where, you know, here is his normal life in the normal world. And about 10 pages in, um, something has to happen. And the thing that has to happen there is uh, what if it didn't happen, you would not have the story. So that activates the character. And then we go up into uh, building up to act two. Um, you know, we find he hits like the threshold guardian. Usually there's some sort of setback. Up till, till the second part, the character has been passive but usually getting swept up in something. And then it's at that point that they decide to actively um, uh, pursue their goals. Um, now, this is a trick you can play, uh, by the way, when you're, whenever you're watching movies. Um, I talked to my wife and she annoyed her friends with it. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the, uh, the, the Dracula movie that, recently, that came out a few years ago where they're trying to do the uh, Paramount Monsters like oh, yes. extended universe. Yes. Yeah. So. My, after I taught this screenplay uh, format to my wife, she went into the movie with a friend of hers, and um, they said, like, towards the beginning, um, it was like, um, you know, like, you can't drink human blood. And Melanie turned to her uh, friend and was like, at 7.33, she's going to drink human blood. And, of course, it gets 7.33, like, on the dot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, this leads into, uh, as I said, like at 50%, there is usually some sort of huge thing that happens. Like the 50% mark um, is the point of no return. Um, so 50%, like if you go and you, and you can do this on Netflix, just click halfway through, halfway through, and you'll see the same type of scene over and over again. Um, this, and sometimes like in movies that are bad, like I think like I think Mission Impossible 3 or 12 or whatever, like <laughs> they have this whole thing where like Tom Cruise has to climb down the side of a building and, and you know to get into where these computer servers are. Why did they do that? Because they know that they need an action sequence at that point in the movie. Uh, and if they don't put an action sequence there, their boss will come in and say, hey, why, why are you not hitting this? I read this and saved the cat. You've got to... <laughs> uh, um, from there, you go on to, there is a, a point called uh, the Dark Knight of the Soul. Um, this is, there's the first pursuit to the goal of the movie, um, and that will end usually with either with a false victory or false defeat. So going from like the, the midpoint, the midpoint is exactly when the Millennium Falcon lands on the Death Star. The second, the first pursuit to the goal is when the characters, they have a false victory, they escape, um, but the Empire's tracking. Um, now normally also, by the way, that will reverse. So if they have a, a, a false victory, um, they will then have a false defeat on their second pursuit to the goal, mm -hmm. uh, or vice versa. That will usually happen. Um, 
So then once you get to the false uh, victory or false defeat of the first attempt, coming off of that, you come to the dark night of the soul. And this is the lowest point of any of the, the for the characters. It's about 75% in. We've all seen these scenes. When I was a little kid, I was like, uh-oh, I, I don't like this because now the movie's getting sad. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but that is a really key tentpole scene, especially one that the executives will lock onto. So then you go from Dark Knight of the Soul, the character goes through uh, some sort of rebirth or apotheosis or whatever, um, and then that goes into uh, what, uh, what George Strayton, because uh, he was the one that taught me uh, action writing, uh, will refer to as crazy suicidal plan. <laughs> it doesn't matter like what movie is, what genre it is, if it's a romantic comedy or if it's an action flick, it's always a crazy suicidal plan. Like, maybe not ne necessarily suicidal, but self-destructive, a way that if they do not succeed, it's, it's not going to be good. Um, so they do this crazy suicidal plan, that leads into uh, either a false victory or false defeat, which then is at the climax, and then, you know, they get whatever it is that they're doing, they're changed, and, uh, the, um, and the film moves on into closing. So when you're writing as a playwright, you have so much freedom. You can live in a scene. You can sit there and like really like go through, you know, dialogue and have people just kind of talk to each other. The only person who can get away with that in Hollywood is Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, plays are expected to be like that, and there's you know no real set format. There's usually you know you've got some uh, restrictions on it. Like some theaters do not want to run, for instance, a play that goes more than two and a half hours because the audience will need another bathroom break. <laughs> um, or in the fringe, you don't want the, the play to run too long because they can't bring another play in directly after you. Um, so it's stuff like that. Uh, the, the practical concerns of the medium are totally different. Where, and also, like you know, if you're writing for theater, you gotta be careful as to what kind of um, you know, things that you're actually writing and putting on stage, are they uh, effective uh, or doable? Uh, I remember when I wrote Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, the full uh, you know, two-hour play that we did in the Fringe, I wrote towards the end of it, I couldn't... So she, Rapunzel was fighting the big bad wolf, and he's been stalking them the entire time, and Rapunzel wins and kills him. I know that's going to happen. So I said, okay, here we are. She's battling um, the big bad wolf, and she kills him. And if this were a movie... She would grab both sides of his jaw and tear them apart until, the, until his head ripped in half. Which, by the way, that, that was in Twilight. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I think it was Dakota Fanning. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I choose to believe that whoever wrote that screenplay got that from me. Yeah, no. It's <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I said, okay, but this is theater, so find a way to do something like that. Eventually we did like um, sort of a Mortal Kombat, like, drove her hand through, grabbed the heart, pulled it out, and did like a spine rip. Uh, oh, again, no. out, out Josh Connor's back, because it's him <laughs> at this point. Um, all right, so um, from, so as I said, certain things will work on stage that will not work in film, mm -hmm. and certain approaches will not. You, you always want to, when you are adapting or you're writing something, even if it's the same story, you want to do it in a way that is most conducive to what the actual strengths uh, of that are. Um, so that's what essentially that's where you're going from theater to film. It is first uh, dialogue, um, yeah, dialogue and character. Going from dialogue and character, you're going to a very strict visual format. Um, that has to fit inside a very, very specific kind of box if you ever want any hope of having someone in Hollywood produce it. Um, and uh, by the way, I should mention this also. The screenplay structure, however it is, like there's a bunch of different ones. The secret one that all the writers are doing now is seven act structure, which fits on over the, I was giving you guys basically the three act structure and they don't want the uh, executives to find out about it because once they find out that writers are doing that, then they'll get a book on that and <laughs> start, uh, you know, making demands. Um, yeah. So the uh, moving 
from that from a very free form um, and, a, and a medium where you can rely on other people to come up with what the, you haven't been able to think of or, or whatever going from that to you need to be spelling out like every single bit of action you know but you need to do it in a way that the director doesn't think you're trying to direct from the page because then they don't want to they don't want to make the, your that movie because then they don't have any creativity to add um, and you know these things are huge and very very expensive um, so then um, you basically have to write in such a way that they will read quickly like the, how everything appears on the page you want as much empty white space on the page as possible but you also need to be implying uh, you know specific things or movements or you know aspects of the scene so that the director again gets incepted and thinks that you know you, he's the one that had that idea that, that that's kind of the perfect script in my opinion mm -hmm. um, yeah so then uh, you go from that to comics now comics, um, my uh, mentor Ron Marks, who writes for uh, Witchblade and Green Lantern and Marvel vs. DC, great guy by the way, um, who I also met him through Jacob Kruger Studios because they bring a lot of like very legit professionals in. Um, he, so what he always says is he thinks that, that comic writing is the most difficult of all three. And um, you know, and of course he's going to say that he's a comic book artist, but or a comic book writer. But no, I think he's he's absolutely right, because you've gone from an academic form that's very free, where you can do pretty much anything so long as it fits like within a single space or several small spaces. Um, if you want the the fact that it's theater to be maximized to a very, very regimented, uh, very format specific, beat for beat, minute for minute, like um, style of writing. And to do, and you know, to be creative within uh, those parameters is really the task of a screenwriter, uh, to be subtle, to be creative, uh, and still be able to, you know, give something to them that as a rich person that doesn't know anything at all about art can go through and go, yes, 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 and check off everything mm -hmm. on the checklist. Because, you know, it's also, um, so a lot of the time also with these types of positions, um, not only are they not feeling comfortable in what they're doing, because this is not what they train for, um, but also not only, they are, uh, at the same time, they don't want anyone to find out that they're doing something wrong, you know, that they don't know what they're doing. And then you add on to the fact that um, not only do they not want anyone to find out, but all of their decision making is fear based decision making because they don't know if the movie is going to be good. And if the movie isn't good, if it doesn't make its money, the hammer comes down on them. Mm -hmm. So, and this is really why films will oftentimes get stuck in like development hell, where you sell the, you, you sell the movie, they want to do it, but then there's a change and someone else comes in and that guy wants to get rid of your movie because even though they've already bought it and they've already optioned it and are ready to go, that was the last guy's thing. And if it doesn't work out, then they still get blamed because the last guy isn't on it. <laughs> so yeah, there's there's uh, the the actual business of writing screenplays is <sighs> awful <laughs> and frustrating. <laughs> but it's also like it's a really fun form to write in. Um, and what George would always say um, is that when you are writing to a Hollywood screenplay format, be that seven act structure or three act structure or I don't know, hero's journey or whatever. Um, don't think of it like a map, like, like a guide. What you want to do is when you are writing, and most people, most writers do this instinctively, um, you will hit points where you're like, ah, the scene isn't working and I don't know how to fix it. And at the same time, similarly, like other, um, you know, uh, professionals, actors, directors, whatever, you know, especially in the theater, will come in and give their spin on it. It's, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Um, but, like, go back to the format then. Because odds are that that's, the form exists, one, to benefit executives, make them feel more comfortable about it. 
Two, to benefit audiences, because when we go to the theater, we or, or, or like the movie theater, we expect certain things to happen. You know, um, like Frozen, great example. Like <laughs> Frozen, uh, and they were very creative with it. Um, but it's a Disney movie, and if it's a Disney movie, what we know is that there must be a princess, and there must be a kiss. <laughs> And all the little girls and boys who go to this movie with certain expectations are going to get mad if there isn't. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's called feeding the genre beast. Um, you know, very much the same way as like, if you go to a Star Wars movie and there's no epic space battle, you're going to get mad. <laughs> because, you know, there's certain, again, there's certain expectations. And people have subconscious expectations because they don't know the format, mm -hmm. but they know what movies they like and they've seen it again and again and again and that, you know, that gets in yeah. with your thinking. So if people are saying like, oh, this scene is dragging, you know, uh, go back, look at the format, it's probably you've missed a, a specific tentpole or you have a scene that goes on just a little bit too long and people get nervous and fidgety. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so then we're gonna go to comics. Now comics is like the inverse of everything. <laughs> because with regard to like the play scripts, um, you know, these are being written for academics, for actors. Um, they are open, you can technically do whatever you want, but they're still structured in, in terms of like the well-made play uh, that you know they teach you a lot about in college is I love that they have a format that's just like the well-made play, like every other play is garbage. <laughs> um, you know, but it's still structured. Like, I mean, 90, for instance, um, you know, the big way that theater has been moving, because when I was in college, um, you know, they, because they had a bunch of students around, you know, they wanted everybody to have like a, ch a chance to act on the stage, as many people as possible. So they did large big cast shows that ran a long time because of course they're going to do that they're getting you know subsidized um, commercial theater on the other hand is moving away from that to the 90 minute one act mm -hmm. why are they moving away from that because the person can come see a show for 90 minutes then go out and get a drink and dinner mm -hmm. as opposed to if you go two and a half hours or three hours you know, all you've really got is is like the bar and the bathroom. And by the way, I don't know if anybody's been to like a Broadway show in New York, but the line to the women's bathroom <laughs> is no, brutal. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I was so, too slow to do a lot in Act Two and still go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, you totally yeah, get it. Yeah. Um, so you know, you you've had a little bit of structure, not not a lot and some room to play then you have very heavy structure that you to be creative you have to learn how to be creative and subvert things like within the lines um, a thing that I'll, an example of this by the way because people are like oh if you write like this it's all going to be the same it's not um, beat for beat Black Panther and Thor Ragnarok are the same movie like literally yeah it's there's a there's a uh, there's there's a, a father figure uh, who did something wrong in the past and has been trying to cover it up. There's a sudden unknown, uh, you know, sibling that comes and, and takes over and injures the hero and removes, yeah. yeah. It, the, the same movie, but totally different experiences watching it. Um, and that's, you know, again, that's, if your writer is really good, that's when you're going to see that. So then you move to comics. And um, just to break this up before I get into comics, uh, I'm going to show you the second trailer. Uh, really quickly here. So this is my other series. This was, and the reason I'm showing you this now is that um, this was adapted, or I originally wrote this as a screenplay uh, with Stephen Moulton uh, under him. He's a former HBO exec. Great guy to work with. And now I am taking that screenplay and I'm moving it into comics. And I'm always, I always think to myself, oh, well, I've already written this story. This will be easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so this is the second one. This is uh, for my historical uh, comic, Drury Shadow of the People. Preciado es la libertad. Hay que 
This has been done in, in two cases with me. One, I went for, for Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, I went play to screenplay because I wrote a 60-minute um, TV pilot um, to uh, comics. Um, and each one of these different things, they, they had very specific things that the mediums did well, and they, they but the story had to change in a, a number of subtle and sometimes big ways. Um, Rudy, for instance, one of the good things about going from a, uh, a film script to a comic, the Rudy is basically a mid-budget war epic. So I gotta find someone to throw like 50 million dollars at that script, you know, and I don't know anyone who can throw 50 million dollars at just, anything. Just 50 so. million? It, probably more. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, especially with inflation, you know. Um, so, and when you've got that going, you know, there, there's a lot of other things that are coming in. So to fully realize the vision that is in the script, it's like, the, the script is like a skeleton, mm -hmm. you know? And you really want to get the meat on the bones. You want a person, not a, not a skeleton. Mm -hmm. um, so the good thing about uh, Daruti and Snow White Zombie Apocalypse as comics is visually speaking, the only thing holding me back is the size of the page and the skill of the artist. And of course, my own skill or lack thereof. <laughs> um, so when you are writing a, um, a comic script, what you are essentially writing instead of this, you know, document for a, um, you know, for, for an academic or a commercial theater producer uh, who doesn't make any money. <laughs> um, <laughs> to um, writing a very specific, very rigid docu you know, document that is going to get past a board kid and executive and is going to excite a director and actors to work on it. Uh, to essentially what you're doing with an artist is you are sending them basically a really long personalized letter <laughs> that is broken down into what you need to do. So, a, something that happens like in a screenplay, for instance, um, you know, uh, Derudi uh, runs down the street. Um, you know, that will get broken up into uh, a number of different um, uh, like panels to get it. Maybe you see Derudi at the beginning, you see the decision to run, and you go down to the next panel, uh, you see him like moving, you see someone else chasing him. It's like like a film, you're going shot to shot to shot, but unlike a film, nothing moves. So you have to give the impression of movement. The, the reader has to learn to jump from panel to panel, and you need to do it in a way that is exciting and stimulating to them. Because you could have the best story in the world, but if you are not successfully translating that to the page in a way that is digestible for the reader, it doesn't matter. They'll get bored and stop reading. And then, um, you know, then they're not going to buy another comic from you. <laughs> um, so really what you need to be doing in that instance is, one, and this is really, really important, you need to be writing stuff that um, your artist is going to be excited to draw. 
Because mm -hmm. one, that will get them involved in the interest in being involved in the, in the process, and it, usually they're very, very expensive. If they really like it, sometimes you can get them to take less, <laughs> which can be key. Um, but also, like, you know, you want to be writing in a way that your vision comes across to that particular artist. And what's very important to understand about writing to a visual artist is they, unless you, you've got somebody who's gone through theater school and then went through art school or something, like, you've got someone who doesn't have the background that you have, um, who doesn't necessarily have, like, the, um, Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this back to what we did uh, at the Star Theater when I was uh, choreographing the fights for Peter Pan uh, a little <laughs> over a decade ago. Um, and we had uh, one uh, young lady playing Tiger Lily. Now, I had remembered Hook when I was growing up, and that moment where Rufio died was just devastating to, the, I don't know, I was 10. <laughs> and so I'm just like, I want that moment. I want people to think that, you know, Captain Hook is actually dangerous, you know? And so I, was, I, I went to, to Jerry, uh, who was directing, um, and I'm like, Jerry, I, I, need, I need this guy to be dangerous. Um, you know, I, got, I wanna kill someone. Can I kill a lost boy? And he's like, no, you can't kill a lost boy. And I'm like, okay, can I kill an Indian? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you can kill an Indian. <laughs> and so I was just like, okay, can I kill Tiger Lily? <laughs> And he agreed to it. And um, yeah, I, 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 every night after that scene had happened, because she gets like stabbed and dragged off stage well, by the pirates laughing, it's all red. Like there was like a line of kids in the front just completely shocked. <laughs> uh, but you know what? When the curtain comes back up and there's that final fight with Captain Hook, there's real drama and real tension there. Um, which again, is one of the most important things about writing. And telling any kind of a story you know, you want to have that person, what happens next? What happens next? What happens next? And even if people understand, you know, screenplay format, they can still get swept away, you know? If, um, because like, again, with my wife, where she said to her friend, like, yeah, hey, it's 7.35, he's gonna drink, he's gonna drink human blood. <laughs> and then of course, 7.35 rolls around and he's drinking human blood and Melvin's like, <laughs> and she never invited her to the movies again. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you are writing for an artist, um, one of the big important things that I always try to do is I want to trigger their creativity. Just like with the um, screenplays and with stage plays, you want people like to really um, be excited to work on your work and to be able to add their own twist on it. Because if they're able to, as I said, like when I was an actor, the reason I stopped, um, other than not being very good, um, <laughs> the reason I stopped was I did not like being part of someone else's creative vision and not being able to do my own thing with it. And because it's very hard to find a, a theater director who will let you do that, unless you know, you're like Al Pacino or something. <laughs> um, so, um, when you allow another person to express themselves, now you make sure that you're doing this with somebody who's actually good and qualified, <laughs> um, but when you let them do that, that gets them passionate about the story, and that gets them to go the extra mile, even if they're just being paid, you know, by the page, to make something that looks great, as opposed to something that is just passable. Um, now, there's a lot of other really interesting techniques that can be used in uh, visual storytelling that can't be done on the, uh, on the uh, that absolutely cannot be done on the screen or on the stage. Um, you know, there's certain comic books that people have tried to adapt that just absolutely like are pr <laughs> <laughs> It might be out of, uh, oh, did it stop when you grabbed it or did it, it already stopped a while ago? The alarm shut it off. Okay, good, yeah. great. Now this will be up on Facebook in two parts. I was I was actually worried it would run out of space. I've been up to the red, so you're you're good. You're excellent. Yeah. So um, I lost my, my my momentum there. I'm getting heckled by my own phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are things that can be done in comics um, that simply cannot be replicated in any other medium, and there are things that will hit 
hard. Um, and every medium is like this. Uh, theater, for instance. Um, okay, so theater, I'm just gonna say this after. Nudity is way more powerful in theater than it is in film. <laughs> And I know this because I wrote a nude scene in that. I did a play called North to Maine, and I got praised by critics for it being tasteful and story-driven. But, you know, the actors were like, you know, you're sitting here. My mom was sitting here, and like one of my best friends was right there and wearing absolutely nothing naked as a jaybird. And my mom was just sitting there. Yeah. I know him. Yeah, but I'll tell you. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, he was my best man at my wedding, so she felt weird. <laughs> but you can see how that and lots of other things can hit a lot harder on stage than they would ever hit on film, because on film you've got the, the, the um, screen between you, and then you've also got executive meddling and everything else um, and then we go from that to uh, to comics and one of the things that's really cool about comics is why I will recommend that everyone reads not just American comics but manga manga is really important to read um, because there have been some amazing things that they have done in the pages of manga with just like you know uh, just like ink on paper pretty mm -hmm. much uh, berserk Phenomenal yes. book, yeah. Very good. I had the first volume. Oh yeah, I, I won't. I won't spoil anything. <laughs> yeah. But Berserk, like, um, you know, this was started being drawn in like '84, a year before I was born, or a year after I was born. Um, and like, um, the artist originally like wanted his character guts, you know. To, he he created him because he thought he would have a unique fighting s style because he had a big sword. Uh, mm -hmm. that he hadn't seen before, and like a, a cannon on his arm. You know, that, that was what started. But then, you know, the series has gone on so far and become so uh, in-depth that it's like one of the classics, one of the absolute classics of any kind of sequential art. Um, so if you watch what he does in Berserk, he's not simply giving you the story panel for panel. He's drawing it in such a way that, um, like, Guts's sword seems to have an immense amount of heft and weight to it, and every time it's swung, it is like it's devastating. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, he doesn't draw the sword, he, he will draw the, the, the panel of him getting ready, he will draw it moving, and sometimes he'll even have an arrow, you know, a, a motion line through, but the sword is always at the end of its arc, and that is what gives it weight. And sometimes it's so big and heavy. He literally has it go out of the panels and onto the page, mm -hmm. which is a, a cool thing you can do in comics, but be careful with that because you will occasionally piss off your, uh, your editor. <laughs> um, but like Mira, could, he could get away with that because, you know, again, his work's absolutely genius. Um, so there, that's like one technique. Um, there's other techniques that can be done also. Um, and, you know, you don't, if you're not doing the art yourself, you don't necessarily need to know a lot about it but it, it can be helpful to prompt this or suggest it uh, to the person you're working with. Um, there is a, um, there's a thing called a neutral mask. This is from, if you ever read the book, uh, Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, yeah, which I highly recommend you do. I read that in college, I was so excited about comics. <laughs> um, but one of the things that he talks about is the neutral mask. And you've even seen this bleed over into film, like you'll notice Iron Man, you know, you, you, you will see Robert Downey Jr.'s face inside, but they spend a lot of time on that helmet. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're doing that is when we are talking, I'm sitting here talking to you, mm -hmm. and I have, you know, we've got my, uh, I'm vaguely aware that I have two eyes and, you know, ears and hair and a head, but I can't see it. I can see you. Mm -hmm. I can see everybody, and I can see really important details on everyone. Um, but it's a bit of a blank for me. As a result, if you, uh, you know, the more basic a image is all the way down to you just do a smiley face <laughs> with two eyes and a, a circle, that's your face. Because that's, you, you identify with that because it's so abstract. The more detailed the face becomes, the more that's the face of someone else. And in fact, horror comics use this, it's mainly manga. Uh, but horror comics in particular, especially horror manga, will use this to alienate readers from a character. 
they will over detail the face or go like really like they'll make it much more detailed than the other characters within their world and this subconsciously you don't notice it but your brain did <laughs> um, and suddenly you start to feel a certain way about the character and they can use that in any number of ways to get you to uh, be successful uh, or otherwise uh, does anybody have the time by the way i want to check and make sure 51 Fif 15 more 51. 51. Oh, 51. 51. Oh, 51. Nine minutes. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so these are kinds. Of, th these are the kinds of things that like you can play with in your tool belt um, when you are gen generally talking about character in particular. When you when you're writing, I think it's very important. Even though like films are mostly plot driven, which is the things that are happening. The only reason anybody cares about a film is character. That is the, the most important thing that you need to be doing. And that is one thing that needs to remain consistent across all of the three mediums. Is you need to be, and what people will get kind of like, um, uh, I, I don't know, uh, hoity-toity about this. They, they, they make too much of it that like your characters, if you do it well enough, will start talking to you. Not literally, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, but it's really, really important that the artist get to some, some of that point, and when you find that that is happening, you listen. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example that I would give is, um, so issue five of Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, which is done, just been lettered, uh, hopefully we'll be launching Kickstarter for it very soon. Um, when I was writing that, um, spoiler, um, they run into a graveyard um, in a zombie apocalypse, and they run into another character there, which is Jack the Giant Slayer. Now, if you get Swaza, and you get my pre prequel, Reign of the uh, Blood-Covered King, parts one and two, you are introduced to Jack the Giant Slayer. And Prince Charming is in one of the scenes with him. Doesn't really say, it's a minor scene, you know. Basically, it establishes that um, the, the king, uh, thinks that Jack is a liar, and thinks rightly, because it is Jack. <laughs> um, so later on, in issue five, when I come back, um, Jack has to lie to my characters and convince them to enter this Viking barrow <laughs> in the middle of the zombie apocalypse. Um, I was pulling from the, uh, the, uh, the saga of Rolf Kroki and his 12 berserker bodyguards, which is one of the most metal fairy tales you will ever find. <laughs> Um, but so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, so Jack's gonna come in. He's gonna lie to them. We'll get him into the into the barrow because I don't care about this stuff outside. I just want to get them on the adventure. And um, so Jack comes up and starts talking to them. And Prince Charming immediately, like I'm trying to write Charming accepting this, but I know Charming's character and I know he would never accept it because he's the kind of guy who would remember Jack's face even after that minor meeting. So. Eventually, like I sat there, I'm like, I know, I, I want to do this, but I can't. Um, but anyway, so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, ah, I can't make him. Do, well, I could make him do this thing, but it, I, I know it's wrong. Um, so I went with it, and um, he asks Jack, "Have we met before?" And Jack looks at him, and he's wondering, you know, what is he? He knows he's met him, but he doesn't know if he remembers. And so he's sitting there, and he says, "No." And Charming turns around, even though my goal is to get them in the damn barrow. <laughs> yeah. He turns around and says, all right, Snowy's out, we're leaving. And uh, Jack is, is like, you know, Jack's like calling after him. He's like, wait. And he's like, no, my father was right. You are a liar, Jack the Giant Killer. And uh, it was so much better than if I just moved them into the thing. So I've talked about all of the differences in adaptations, in the, in, the, in the process, in what you need to accomplish with it, but the similarities in all adaptations, in all stories, whether you are doing a, a, a movie, a, a book, a novel, whatever, the only reason anyone cares about these things is if there are, because there are people and characters within them that we can emphasize, em, empathize with and feel and we understand like what the story means to them. And that's where you get like really, really good writing. When a person sees themselves in a character that is utterly imaginary. So thank you guys very much. It's been an absolute blast.
uh, yeah, thanks for letting me show you my YouTube channel. Okay. Yay! <laughs> Definitely want to stop that now. Yeah. So. I think. Uh, it, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not it's, 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 